Let me begin uh, with three sets of questions. Raise your hand if you know, roughly speaking, within 10 or 20 cents, the price per gallon to fill up your car. Yeah, most people, right? Keep your hand up if you know, roughly speaking, within 10 or 20 cents, the price per gallon to heat your home. Yeah, most people know. Raise your hand if you use a credit card. Everybody. Keep your hand up if you know at the end of the month exactly what your credit card bill will be. Really? Ken? Wow, there are some impressive liars here. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah. It's very impressive if you can, most people can. Finally, raise your hand if sometime in the last two weeks you've gone to bed and promised yourself that the next day you're going to wake up and get some exercise. Okay. Keep your hand up if raising your hand is all the exercise you've gotten <laughs> in the last two weeks. So I ask these questions because they very easily demonstrate some of the fundamental principles of behavioral economics. Some of you may have heard of behavioral economics called behavioral science or nudges or decision-making science, and it's a very exciting field. It's something that's really becoming, in many ways, the future of business. Now, if you think about the uh, questions I asked, the first set was really, what's the price of energy? But in one context, our car, we know, and the other, we don't. That demonstrates something called mental accounting. The second question about credit cards really shows the power of credit cards to harness two behavioral principles. The first is the power of time. The time between when we make a decision and we face the consequences of that decision. When we buy something and we pay for it. The more time there is, the less we're able to accurately value that choice. Credit cards also use aggregation. They combine a bunch of spending decisions into one, so you don't remember any individual because they all get lumped together into 100 items on your bill. And the final question is perhaps most important, reflects the issue of self-control. We can't keep a promise to ourselves, a promise that we know. We exercise tomorrow, we're going to be healthier, happier, we're going to live longer, our families are going to be better, our lives are going to be better. We can't keep that promise to ourselves. So how can we be expected to keep promises to our peers and colleagues and clients, to our, our creditors, to our companies that we work with? It's a challenge. And recognizing these principles and these behavioral flaws is what behavioral economics is all about. Now today I'm going to talk to you about behavioral economics in terms of financial decision making. And I love talking about financial decision making for three reasons. First of all, all of the forces that I will talk about, all of the principles, they don't apply just to your financial decisions. They apply to decisions uh, in ethics and compliance, in employee engagement, motivation and incentives, habits and loyalty, event and experience design. This is what's so exciting about behavioral science is that it applies across business and you're starting to see more and more companies look to it for solutions. Right? For 10 years or so, we've had this data revolution. Everyone has all the data, right? We know every little piece of information about it. But guess what? Fitbit doesn't change anyone's behavior because it lacks that human element. You gotta take the data and combine it with the people science, what people actually do. Not what they say on surveys, but how they behave. Second reason I love talking about money is because money is kind of awesome. I used to be like a money is root of all evil guy, uh, and I still believe it caused a lot of problems. But overall, it's done amazing things because of all of the cool features of money. Right? Compare money, what we have, to our society to be without it, being a bartering society. Right? Money is general. You can use it on anything. Money is divisible. Right? You can break up a $10 bill into 10 ones when you're bartering and you like make a sofa, you can't break that up into different pieces and different sizes. Right? Money is fungible. Any $10 bill is the same as any 10 ones, is the same as a bunch of quarters, same as something electronic. You don't need that specific $10 bill. And money is storable. Right? We can save it, we can invest it, we can plan for our future. And because of the, all these awesome features of money, we've been able to blossom as a society. We've been able to specialize. Right? Without money, we wouldn't be able to be you know, doctors and lawyers and whatever the Kardashians do. <laughs> right? But we're able to do all that. Right? And the real reason why I love talking about money is because we think about it all the time. We obsess about money. But you know what? There's no TV show, Lifestyles of the Frugal and Thrifty. Because right? we obsess about getting money and spending it, we don't think about saving it and investing it. Because that's hard to think about. So much of money is hard to think about. And what I hope that people really take away, if there's only one thing, is that money is hard to think about for everyone. We all, I think, have this subconscious belief that everybody else knows what they're doing with money. That's not true. 
I'll give talks to wealth advisors, right? These firms that are advising rich people what to do with their money. And, and almost every time I hear a story that's very similar, you know, someone tells me that their highest performer, the person who is best at managing his or her client's money, is the worst at managing their own, right? They're over leveraged, they spend too much money, they drive fancy cars. Right? Now, why is that? Because when I'm advising you what to do with your money, I'm looking at a spreadsheet, I'm looking at data. Right? I can say, here's how you invest in your college fund, here's how you invest in your retirement fund. But suddenly when it's about me, those are my kids. Right? That's my retirement. Emotions come pouring in. And even though I know the numbers and the spreadsheets, I don't act rationally. Right? Now, I've seen this and it sort of, this irrationality has driven some things until I found behavioral science. Like, uh, I went to Princeton, then I went to law school, then I went to Burning Man two or seven times. Uh, <laughs> And at Princeton, I studied economics with the best. I studied Ben Bernanke, former head of the Fed, was a teacher. Uh, Alan Blinder, presidential advisor. I also studied with some other old white guys. So you know it was a good education. Right? And I got it, and I got good grades, and I graduated magna cum laude, whatever, and I went to law school, more basic decision-making structure. But that didn't resonate with me. That wasn't like real. It wasn't how humans actually behaved. And I heard this, uh, this fable of a desert island. Stranded on the desert island is a physicist, a geologist, and an economist. They have one can of food. Right? They have no can opener. How are they going to get it? The physicist says, let's rub it on the ground until it heats up and pops open. The geologist says, no, let's smash it with a rock. The economist says, let's just assume we have a can opener. <laughs> <laughs> That's traditional economics, and you know what happens when you assume. Uh, I didn't connect with that, right? And a lot of people didn't. And in came, comes behavioral economics. It doesn't deny traditional economic decision making. It looks at that, but it adds in human psychology, human reality, right? Traditional economics says you go to a store and the milk is 10 cents more expensive than the store next door, you go next door to get it. Well, real life, you got a screaming kid in the cart, you got another one you got to pick up from soccer, you're texting with your clients, right? There's stress and there's uncertainty and there's human reality. And behavioral science looks at that. It looks not what you say on a survey you're going to do, but what your actual behavior is. And behavioral science understands that we have a hard time making rational value judgments, right? valuating the worth of something. And ultimately, all decisions are value judgments. Right? You weigh the two choices. All decisions, whether it's what to buy or where to work or even something ethical. Right? Like, should I murder someone right? or should I stay in line at the DMV? Right? <laughs> It's a tough call <laughs> because we're all human. Right? I've heard other speakers touch on this too. We're all human. Right? And you cannot change human nature. You cannot change human nature. But we can understand human nature so that we then create systems and products and services and environments so that we use our human nature to get to the best results for ourselves, our clients, and our organizations instead of having our human nature used against us. The first step towards understanding that human nature and why it's so hard to think about money and financial decision making is to think back, what is human nature? What is it really? I mean, excuse me, what is financial decision making? Well, it's about something called opportunity costs. I don't want to give you flashbacks to your Econ 101. So basically, when you're making a financial decision, you're supposed to weigh what you're going to buy with the opportunity costs. And the opportunity costs are anything else you could spend that money on now or any time in the future. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot to imagine. Right? What we're supposed to do is we're going to go buy that $5 latte in the morning and we hear Susie Orman's voice yapping in our head. <laughs> and that could be your retirement savings, compound interest. That's terrible, Susie Orman. She's a wonderful person. Uh, <laughs> we're supposed to think about anything it could be. Absolutely. Think about how hard that is to think about all the possibilities. Humans don't want to do that. We don't want the hard way, we want the easy way. So we don't think about these opportunity costs, so we don't value things rationally. And it's not that we don't even come uh, you know, close, right? We, we don't even start valuing opportunity costs. My co-author uh, went to a Toyota dealership, and he asked people about to spend $30,000 on a car. He said, if you don't spend $30,000 on this Toyota, what else could you spend it on? People couldn't think of anything. They pressed him, what else could you spend this $30,000 on It's not on a Toyota? Nothing, nothing. They kept pressing, they kept pressing. 
Best answers that they finally got were, well, if I don't spend $30,000 on a Toyota, I could spend it on a Honda. <laughs> it's not a different choice. It's a different brand. But people couldn't get out of their way. They couldn't think about the opportunity costs. And what ends up happening is when we don't think about those things, we fall for these other little traps, these little nudges, these little principles. And those are some of the things I'd like to talk about with you today. 